Hello, everybody. I hope you're all doing fine. Uh, thank you for being us today, attending this webinar about uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, current regulatory landscape and corporate impact of AI across the regions. This is organized by Ally Law. So uh, let me first introduce our organization and myself and provide you with a couple of words about who we are. As many of you may know, Alelo is a global network of 80 mid-sized independent law firms with almost uh, 3,000 professionals uh, all over the world. Our goal is to provide uh, high-quality services around the world, legal services, of course, uh, and that quality, our reliability and consistency uh, has made us uh, to be constantly growing. And one of the reasons why uh, Alelo is ranked year after year among the legal leading global networks uh, by chambers and partners. So for more information, please do visit our website, uh, which is uh, ally-law.com. Regarding me, my name is Lisandro Frene. I'm the IT IP partner of Richard Cardinal, Ali Law's uh, member law firm in Argentina. I am a university professor in the data privacy space, and I'm the chair of the platforms and social media subcommittee of the International Bar Association. So during the next 90 minutes, we'll talk about the current status of AI regulation, as we've said, um, with the impact of the recent European AI Act in the horizon, and, um, uh, and how to legally help companies manage AI business challenges um, for that, we have a brilliant panel of prestigious top IT lawyers from different jurisdictions within five continents. So thank you again for being here and leave you with our uh, next speaker. Hi, everybody. My name is John Rolecki. I'm a partner at Varnum LLP, co-chair of the firm's privacy and mobility group. Um, I am located in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Wanted to uh, first thank Ally Law for the opportunity. Uh, what a wonderful group, Ally Law, as always. Uh, and second, just wanted to give a quick uh, disclaimer that what I'm talking about today are, are my opinions, my thoughts, and don't constitute legal advice today. So with that, here we go. Um, AI developments, regulatory frameworks, and best practices. And I'm presenting with respect to uh, my home jurisdiction, the United States. Um, a theme of what we're gonna be talking about today is uh, where the US is in terms of AI regulation. And the recurring theme we're gonna hear over and over again is the application of existing law. And the reason why that is, is that while certain states here and there have promulgated or in the course of promulgating regulations, specifically regulating the use of AI, um, that is not generally the case in a given jurisdiction. So by and large regulators, and we'll see as we go through, have taken the position that existing laws can be enforced and enforced aggressively for the purpose of regulating AI. You can see on the screen here, um, a primary mode of this uh, regulatory oversight is FTC oversight and regulation, uh, Federal Trade Commission, other federal agency oversight, um, which may or may not apply depending on your particular application, and then existing U.S. data privacy laws as well, which um, include California, some other states we'll talk about briefly. These are um, coming into force across the nation now and again, and tend to include concepts, which we'll talk about in a little bit greater detail, that would cover AI activity. So first, FTC oversight. Um, there's a very old law, FTC Act Section 5, which prohibits unfair and deceptive trade practices. The FTC has over the last several years, aggressively enforced Section 5 and interpreted it to include a wide range of governance over data privacy matters. Um, and that includes now artificial intelligence. So what are unfair and deceptive practices? 
unfair practices, something that, as we see up on the screen, causes substantial injury to consumers that isn't reasonably avoidable or outweighed by countervailing benefits, um, tricking people into harmful choices. And we've seen these concepts come up uh, consistently in the data privacy context. We're seeing the same thing uh, from the FTC with respect to artificial intelligence. Um, deceptive practices, I have a few examples up here, exaggerating what AI can do, uh, falsely promising some benefit from AI relative to non-AI, sort of traditional application, uh, false claims regarding AI, and really notably, um, remaining unaware of the risks of using AI. So what the FTC is saying here is that this law, which is in existence, Section 5, already regulates AI. And everybody has to educate themselves, says the FTC, regarding the risks of AI because willful ignorance is not going to be a defense. Remaining unaware of the AI system's risks is not going to be a defense. Um, that is something that I think we have to take very seriously in light of the FTC's um, demonstrated enforcement, um, doing what they say they're going to do in these areas. And on that point, um, I think an extrapolation we can make is that we've seen um, plaintiff's bars around the country in the context of data breaches leverage uh, a negligence per se theory under Section 5 as a way to get to common law negligence-based class action lawsuits against companies. Um, I suspect that plaintiff's bars will take the same approach with respect. It's really the same building blocks. It's just instead of applying it to data security, here will be artificial intelligence using Section 5, which doesn't have a private right of action, don't want to get into the weeds too much, um, but does under a certain legal theory um, give plaintiffs the ability to say, well, the FTC imposes a certain standard here prohibiting unfair and deceptive practices. It's meant to protect consumers. A business failed to uphold that standard. Therefore, there should be a presumption of negligence. And I'm kind of skimming across the top here, but again, it's something that we've seen uh, the plaintiffs bar take advantage of with respect to data security. And I think it's worth noting that because it, it shifts the game from a regulatory concern to a common law plaintiff's bar concern, um, which raises some different considerations for businesses. So moving forward, um, there are a few uh, keywords and then theories I'd like to really make sure that you all come away with with respect to FTC oversight. Um, first is uh, the FTC uh, chairwoman, Lena Khan, has been very, very clear, as has the whole agency, that artificial intelligence must not be used to create unequal outcomes, to further discrimination. Um, we see here in the first bullet point, AI tools must be regulated, the FT FTC says, to regu uh, regulated to prevent discrimination and privacy violations. Again, with existing laws applied to biased decision-making and exploitive uh, data practices. It's the same thing I led with at the outset, which is that the FTC and other regulators are using these existing laws largely to root out the creation of biases through the application of new technology. And AI is right in the crosshairs there. The FTC is using the existing laws to promote fair competition and protect consumers in the AI market, very similar to how the FTC is approaching data privacy. Um, and finally, the FTC wants to ensure accountability for businesses that enable fraudulent activities using AI. That gets back to the point that I stressed on the prior slide, which is that ignorance is not going to be a defense. Um, and by ignorance, I just mean we all have to educate ourselves about how we're using AI, um, exactly what that means within the context of the application. Um, 
how results are being generated and how they're being used. Okay, I'll make this slide quick so I can get through all of my material today. Um, again, existing laws, other agencies are um, uh, similarly adamant that existing laws, which is their role to enforce, um, already govern AI. So that includes the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, DOJ, uh, Civil Rights Division, and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, the, the application, the novel technology really doesn't matter. Um, it's all about making sure that it's being used in a way that's consistent with current laws. I have a few laws in here on the Fair Credit Reporting Act, um, Equal Credit Opportunity Act. These may or may not apply in a given situation. There are others. This is why it's really important to reach out to counsel in this area to assess your given situation in your jurisdiction. Because as I mentioned earlier, the laws in the US um, vary by jurisdiction. We don't have one overarching law um, that's really going to apply here, specifically relating to AI. That's why section five of the FTC Act is, is really the closest we have to that idea of an overarching law regulating AI. Now, there have been efforts toward this overarching regulatory idea. Um, a couple of years ago, the White House released an AI Bill of Rights, I have the full title here, uh, making automated systems work for the American people. Um, we see similar themes here, uh, a set of five principles, safe and effective systems, protection against discrimination in use of algorithms, um, protecting data privacy, of course, uh, the principles of notice and explanation of what's being used, how it's used, um, and how, how it works when possible. And then also, interestingly, um, the creation of human alternatives, uh, human consideration into this otherwise sort of inscrutable algorithmic process, um, and human-based fallback as well. So a couple of things to consider. Um, if folks are considering developing AI use policies in their businesses. I mentioned the state-by-state -state patchwork in the United States. Uh, several of these, and these are just a couple of them on the screen here. I have California, Colorado, Virginia, and Connecticut. There are more. Um, so again, if you're in a certain jurisdiction that's not one of these, don't assume that there's not a state-level privacy act that wouldn't apply. Um, great reason to reach out to your lawyer and, and get more detailed guidance. Um, uh, several of these laws do regulate, the term is generally called profiling um, or automated decision making and require certain disclosures um, or other activities within an organization that is using profiling or automated decision making. And those are defined terms that can vary slightly across uh, jurisdictions. However, in nearly every case, they're going to encompass the use of artificial intelligence. I have a little bit of information here. I'm not going to go into the details um, about these other states. Um, again, uh, a good reason to reach out to counsel and, and, and get tailored advice um, where it applies in your jurisdiction. But I wanted to note that um, in a couple of these state laws, we're seeing certain approaches emerge, which are likely going to continue and are good to think about when developing policies and practices regarding the use of AI. Um, one, I mentioned transparency requirements earlier. Um, one of the sort of operational requirements we're seeing is allowing individuals to opt out of automated decision-making or profiling when it occurs. A second one, which is interesting, and I think is more likely than not here to stay in many jurisdictions, um, is a requirement to perform data protection impact assessments for uh, profiling automated decision making, uh, particularly when that automated decision making involves high risk activities. That can be defined differently from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. In many cases, it involves mm -hmm. the situations that I list here on the second to last bullet point um, financial 
considerations, physical or reputational injury, uh, risks, um, sometimes uh, decision regarding employment, um, intrusion into solitude, seclusion of private affairs. Um, reading this list, you sort of get a sense of what jurisdictions uh, assign to be a high risk profiling activity. Again, that will vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but something to have in mind for sure. Something that I wanted to raise um, for visibility, but really doesn't appear to be in the on the near horizon, so we couldn't be surprised, um, is an overarching uh, federal law um, governing data privacy and the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, there have been several bills introduced in Congress. Uh, none of them, of course, have made it all the way through to actually become law. Um, one of the most current federal privacy bills is this American Data Privacy and Protection Act. Interestingly, uh, this draft legislation does include the requirement for the risk impact assessments that I mentioned earlier. Again, we're seeing the laboratory of states sort of experimenting with different types of regulation, um, not just for data privacy, but here for artificial intelligence. And the more we see more of these concepts come up in the United States, um, and I might add abroad, um, because I do think that US regulators and legislators look abroad to see what works and what doesn't. Um, we, I think we will see more of these start to crystallize and eventually become more widespread law. So that's why I wanna bring out again that this draft law does um, consider those risk assessment obligations, which may not be uh, black letter law yet, but are in the vicinity. So where does that leave us with best practices? I threw a lot out there in a very short space of time. So we see these common themes emerge. AI tools should be transparent, explainable, fair, um, you know, protective to the consumer. The consumer should know what's happening um, and really why. Um, I'll note again that the FTC has taken the position that if the technology is novel or complex, it's really not a defense um, for uh, biased output, for example, or the facilitation of discrimination. Um, maintaining accountability through controls. Um, I've mentioned AI policies a couple of times. That's a good start. Um, and independent feedback, getting uh, active about developing your AI tools, how it's used, and keeping that a, a, a constant gardening, right? Not, not having the same operations for a year if it's not working, constantly assessing, constantly trying to make it better. That will take you a long ways, um, as long as it's documented. Uh, training AI tools with data that will not yield discriminatory or unfair results. That's, that's an ongoing battle, I think, for a lot of companies. Um, but very, very important, as we've seen in the FTC in particular, is, is very strongly trained in on that idea, um, as is the federal government in general. Limiting the use of AI tools, considering any product shortcomings. I think this is just a product of the not burying your head in the sand approach that the FTC has warned against. If AI tools are creating problems in their output, um, if they're not functioning appropriately, according to some of the guideposts that we've identified here, limit their use, right? Take a pause. That's something that will also take, take you a long way. Um, give the, give the uh, sense, I think the, the correct sense, that the business is being intentional about making sure the AI is being used in an appropriate way. On that point, I'll just note quickly here that we've seen um, state's attorney generals reach out to clients uh, with subpoenas, uh, asking for information about AI use and outputs. Um, looking, it's pretty obvious to me, looking for uh, evidence of discriminatory output and ways that the business should or should not have uh, known that that was happening and better controls that could have been implemented. So 
it, this is real. Uh, regulators are trained in on this. And the more documentation and accountability businesses have um, will put you in a much better position legally almost every time. Um, the last two bullet points, implementing privacy and security measures by design. That's inherent in a lot of what I was talking about. Uh, don't wait until you've been using AI for a year to start implementing these accountability tools, um, these, these uh, best practices. Do it from the very, very beginning. It'll be baked in um, and it makes everything so much easier. Um, finally, my favorite, engage in regular risk monitoring and impact assessments. This creates documentation, which can be given to regulators. It creates uh, accountability. It creates uh, data by which a business can determine next steps. Um, it, it, I can't say enough about this last bullet point. Um, if anybody wants to talk to me more about this, I mean, this is just um, a best practice that whatever the ultimate laws end up being and looking like and, and federal um, overarching laws governing AI, engaging in regular risk monitoring and impact assessments for the use of AI will be worth the investment, will put the business on better legal footing and much better positioned to respond to regulators in a way to mitigate legal exposure. So I wanna thank everybody. Um, I know that was a lot. I have the slides there. The slides go a little bit deeper than I think I went in many instances. Um, so please take a look at them. This is an important issue and I'm glad we could talk about it today. Thanks everyone. Hello, my name is Nick Phillips. I'm a partner in Edwin Co which is Ally Law's London-based law firm. Today, I want to talk to you about the UK's approach to regulating AI. So I thought we would start with, with a couple of quotes. Um, the, the first one you see on the screen there is a quote from Rishi Sunak, the, the UK's prime minister. And this was a quote that he gave uh, during a speech to the Royal Society in October, 2023. I'll, I'll leave you to read that. Um, the second one is a quote from the Secretary of State for Science, Innovation and Technology, a lady called the Right Honourable Michelle Donnellan, MP. Um, and this was a quote taken from her forward to the UK government's consultation outcome on AI in February 2024. Now, one of the things which is interesting about Ms. Donnellan's uh, forward to, to, to that consultation outcome was that another thing that she said during that forward was she reported that the value of the UK's AI industry was um, predicted to reach one trillion US dollars by 2035. But I put those two quotes up there because uh, they really sort of demonstrate where the UK is coming from when it comes to regulating AI. And that is all about the opportunity, all about uh, putting innovation first. So let's have a look at what's going on in the world, in, in AI as far as the um, as far as the UK is concerned. Uh, a number of things. It's been a fairly busy time. So. We've got this Frontier AI paper, which was really a sort of discussion paper intended for the AI Safety Summit. Now, the AI Safety Summit was, was fairly important. It was the first summit of its kind uh, hosted in London um, and attended by 29 countries, including, importantly, the US, the EU, China uh, and Japan. Um, and coming out of the AI Safety Summit was what's referred to as the Bletchley Declaration, which was an international declaration made by all the participating nations um, that recognised the, the need to address the risks represented by AI development. Um, and then in terms of regulation in the, in the AI, so in, 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 a, in, terms, in terms of regulation of AI in the UK, we have a sort of a, a white paper published by the UK government in March 2023. And this was really a call for consultation um, 
and I'll come back to that in a second. And then also importantly, we have the Digital Regulation Cooperation Forum, the DRCF, which is um, uh, essentially a bringing together of four really key regulators in this area. So it brings together uh, the Information Commission, the, the Information Commissioner, the ICO, in charge of data privacy, the Competition and Markets Authority, the um, uh, the financial, sorry, the the the, the FCA, um, and 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 Ofcom, um, and their brief is really to achieve better outcomes um, for industry and and for consumers in relation to both the digital world and AI. And one thing to look out for from the DRCF is there's about to be a DRCF AI and digital hub, which has as its aim um, increasing investors' confidence in bringing AI and digital products to market. And that's a government-funded initiative. So that, that could be quite an important development over the next few months. So let's come back to the white paper and the consultation. Well, the, the UK government published the outcomes of that consultation uh, last month in February 2024. Re and it really confirmed uh, in many ways what the UK had said in its white paper. And at the heart of what it's doing, uh, or what its, what its plan is for AI and regulation, is this idea of an agile regulatory approach that doesn't dampen innovation, um, but can adapt to evolving and emerging AI risks. Um, and sort of at the heart of that is this idea of a context-based approach. So essentially, um, the idea is that the UK is going to learn from practice and sort of regulate accordingly so it's not going to sort of regulate based on theory. It's going to wait and see uh, and, and, and learn from the practice of, of, of what comes out of, of AI and AI development. Um, and then weave through that are sort of uh, five sector agnostic cross-sectorial principles. And how this is going to work in practice is that the government, the UK government, have asked a number of key regulators to take away those principles and provide guidance, you know, base, guidance on AI based on those principles. So what we should start seeing see coming out, and we've, we've already seen this in a, in a couple of industries, um, is some really sector specific guidance. So that's the, that, that's the way that the, um, the, gov the government wants to develop AI regulation. And, but there is one fairly big exception to that, and this is, for what the government term highly capable general purpose AI systems. Um, they're not entirely clear what that means, but they, it seems to be um, systems with a huge amount of processing power um, in areas, operating in areas of really high risk. So typically they will be consumer facing. Um, and what the government's saying is that sort of in, in, in in contradistinction to its context-based approach, uh, this is an area that does need regulating uh, now, and there was going to be more on that from the government before the end of 2024. So essentially the idea behind the UK's approach is that it, would, it, is that it will not legislate unless it is satisfied that existing laws or regulations are not adequate and then when it does come to legislate it will do that in a targeted way usually on a sector by sector uh, basis now that I, I just wanted to mention here the the eu's approach to ai and I, I don't, i'm not going to talk for very long about the EU, the eu ai act because i know one of my colleagues from the eu, EU from the eu is going to do a, a, a larger piece on it but um Two, two, two things really, really come out from from the UK's approach. Um, firstly, is that, that you know there's a real difference between the way the UK has gone um, with, with this sort of um, wait and see 
to, to, to wait, wait and see agile approach and with what the EU has developed. So the EU has, has taken a real sort of broad risk-based risk, risk based approach, which essentially goes horizontally through sectors, whereas the UK waiting and seeing, but when it does, when it does um, come up with legislation, it's telling us that it's going to, that's going to be on a sector by sector basis, so, so, so more focused. Um, so diff a real difference in approach there. Uh, but the other thing that's, that, that I think is really noticeable is that just having a quick look at the EU AI Act, it clearly has a sort of extraterritorial effect, uh, not dissimilar to the GDPR, perhaps. So if you're a um, provider of an, an AI system outside of the EU, maybe you're in the UK, but you're providing that AI system into the EU, it's highly likely you're going to be caught by the EU AI Act. So I think a question there is really how that's going to work in, pr in, in practice, where you've got these two very different systems kind of sitting side by side, uh, so geographically at least. Um, and I think the other question, which I'm not going to be brave enough to, to answer uh, in this little session, is um, whose approach is better? Do we prefer the sort of the, the, the UK's agile wait and see approach, very sector specific? Or do we prefer the EU AI Act, um, the approach really of legislating now, um, risk based and, and, and sort of very sort of horizontal ac across sectors? But that might be something we're going to we can come back to and discuss uh, la later on in the session. So I thought before um, before I finish, I would just mention uh, two or three things about the UK's copyright position. Now, copyright is always a, a really important right when it, when it comes to AI. Um, generally speaking, when AI engines are learning, there will be copyright issues because they cop they, they will generally copy um, copyright protected works, and that will mean there will often be issues around the, around copyright infringement when it comes to the output of those engines. And there's always arguments as well about um, the ownership of, of of any sort of material which the um, AI engine produces. So um, against that background, two or three things to note in relation to the UK's position on copyright. Uh, so firstly, uh, back in 2021, we had a consultation on, on essentially on changing the law. Number of things were considered, including sort of introducing a new narrow and much shorter right for AI created works um, and it also looked at things like in enhancing the text and data mining exception so to allowing AI, AI machines to work uh, slightly easier uh, against the sort of legislation. Um, now at the end of all that uh, nothing could be agreed and, and there was this real standoff between what I would term the sort of tech sector, who essentially wanted um, anything that was anything that was created by an AI engine to be owned by the user of the AI engine, and the the, the creative sector, um, which essentially wanted no protection, wanted that AI created material to be freely available to use. So no progress there. So then we moved on uh, last year, 2023, to a voluntary code um, on the interaction between copyright and AI. This is something which the UK Intellectual Property Office was charged with um, developing, with creating. But again, we've, we've very recently heard that that's not going to happen either. But again, largely because there's no consensus as to what that voluntary code might say. So... To, so attempts to change the law to introduce a voluntary code have really gained no consensus, no traction in the UK. Then the very, very final point, which is kind of a very, uh, which I think is a very interesting point of UK law. We have this provision in section 9.3 of, of our Copyright Act, which essentially says, I've said it out there, but it essentially says that for a literary, dramatic, musical or artistic work, which is computer generated, the author shall be taken to be the person by whom the arrangements necessary for the creation of the work are undertaken. 
Um, now, what I should say is that this provision has been in our Copyright Act since the very beginning, since 1988. It's never been amended and almost certainly wasn't drafted with AI-generated works in mind. Um, but it does have the rather interesting, or arguably rather interesting result of allowing in a system where an AI engine could create a work which would be protected by copyright. Now, I should say there are arguments going the other way. And for example, the generally accepted definition of originality for literary, dramatic, musical, or artistic works is that they must be the author's own intellectual creation. Um, so that's, that by itself makes it quite difficult for an, for an AI engine to, to, you know, to, to create a copyright protected work. But it could be said that section 9.3 was really intended to be an exception to that. Um, it does talk about computer generated works. Um, so that's really up for debate in the future. And I think one of the other problems with this section is um, it can be quite difficult to identify the person by whom the arrangements necessary for the creation of the work are undertaken. Um, and again, we probably need some, some case law on that in the, in the context of AI engines. Um, so I think I'll leave it there um, so on that fairly interesting point, a point of UK law. And I look forward to, to discussing AI and regulation generally. Hi, everyone. I'm Taketo Nasu, uh, Blakeman Mitsuki in Tokyo. Today, I'd like to talk about copyright issues arising out of generative AI, because in Japan, we don't have a uh, law of comprehensive AI regulating uh, generative AI matters. Instead, the Japanese government uh, proposed guidelines for AI business operators. This is nothing more than soft law. It is not uh, regulate the, uh, all people concerned. They uh, are applicable to AI developers, AI pro providers, and the AI users as well. And uh, these guidelines require to comply with international guidelines and the code of ethics adopted by Hiroshima AI process. So uh, I'm focusing myself uh, on the uh, copyright issues this time. And this is a general example of generative AI. As you see, uh, you collect and the process learned data to make training data set. By inputting training data set into learning program, pre-learning pro parameters therein are adjusted and the training model is developed. Then when you give instructions or prompts to train the model therein in inference program, AI product is generated. In the uh, AI developed learning stage and the uh, generation utilization stage, as you see in, in the slides, there are two stages. The acts of using copyrighted materials are different and the applicable provisions of the relevant copyright acts are also different. So in considering the copyright issues, the above two stages need to be considered separately. And uh, there's uh, another uh, issue that uh, it is also necessary to consider uh, whether AI products can be considered copyrighted work. So let's see the uh, first stage, AI development learning stage. Assuming that uh, learning data uh, is a copyrighted work, collecting and copying copyrighted works as training data constitutes reproduction and uh, publishing the created training data set on the uh, web constitutes public transmission. So 
The issue is whether or not it is required to get permission of copyright holder uh, to collect and uh, copy uh, copyrighted works uh, to uh, reproduce uh, training data set. In Japan, uh, we have a provision in Copyright Act uh, where it says, in principle, no permission of a copyright holder is required if the use of copyrighted work is not for the purpose of enjoying the ideas or feelings expressed in the work for oneself or others to enjoy them. For example, the literary works can be read. To read, the act of a reading uh, can be called enjoyment. Likewise, for the uh, program works, the uh, execute program works is called enjoyment. For a musical movie, to appreciate means enjoyment. The background of this provision is that uh, the economic profits that copyright holders receive from their works are generally considered to be paid in return for the benefit of satisfying these intellectual and spiritual needs by enjoying the ideas or feelings expressed in the work. On the other hand, acts for non-enjoyment purposes are generally not considered to harm the economic interests of the copyright holder, even if they can be carried out without the permission of the copyright holder. But there are some exceptions. First, where the purpose of enjoyment and non-enjoyment coexist, uh, this uh, provision uh, will not be applicable. Still, there's uh, another uh, clause in the Copyright Act of Japan. It allows minor exploitation or use of copyrighted works incidental to information analysis by computer processing. So, there remains some room to use copyrighted works without permission of the copyright holder, even though the Article 30 hyphen 4 uh, will not be applicable. The second, where the interest of the copyright holder uh, would unreasonably be prejudiced. For example, processing the data set as a whole to uh, make a, a training data set. It is undisputedly uh, considered that uh, it must uh, prejudice, uh, unreasonably uh, prejudice the interest of the copyright holder of database. The last but not least, contractual or technical override is not prohibited. Then let's go to the next stage, generation utilization stage. Reproduction or adaptation of copyrighted works uh, may occur uh, when the uh, generating products relying on existing copyrighted works or saving generated work products including existing copyrighted work on the server of PC. We should uh, see uh, another uh, stage where uh, the uh, public transmit or transfer of uh, copyrighted works may occur. For example, when you upload generated products, it may consist, constitute a public transmit. Or if you sell a, a copy of generated products, it may constitute transfer. To, be, to determine whether or not uh, such acts uh, may cons constitute copyright infringement, it should be de determined in the same way as in normal cases, such as when a person draws a picture without using AI. Under the Japanese case law, uh, we uh, consider uh, from the, the following two elements, similarity and dependence. For the first step, we will see a similarity, meaning whether or not the uh, accused AI product uh, is identical or similar to uh, another person's existing copyrighted works. Then the next stage, if uh, the similarity is recognized, 
then uh, we'll see whether or not uh, such accused AI products uh, is dependent in, on another person's works. If uh, both steps uh, can be recognized, we'll find infringement. Otherwise, uh, we don't see a infringement. Last but not least, uh, AI products are generally not considered copyrighted works because it is not made by, made by a human beings. However, uh, it can be a considered a copyright works if a person uses AI as a tool to creatively express his or her thoughts or feelings. Okay, my time is up. Thank you for listening. While we wait uh, to the final text and formal enactment of the uh, European AI Act, which is expected for mid-April, hopefully, let's take a quick look at the AI regulatory panorama in Latin America and from Argentina. So the scenario here, as in many other jurisdictions with the sad exception of Europe, is that we do have several soft law uh, directives. I wouldn't call them regulations. Uh, we have national strategies, frameworks, AI, ethical principles, guidelines for reliable AI, and, and so on. Uh, this is the case of Argentina, Chile, Peru, Colombia, Brazil, um, Uruguay, to name just a few countries in, in South America. Uh, only in Argentina, four AI directives were enacted last year. All of them provide for a generic abstract uh, overbroad intentions uh, and principles, uh, which may be useful for future regulations, but currently they do not have uh, practical implementation. Uh, the European AI Act is a landmark regulation precisely because it, it is the opposite. It's the first uh, law of its kind in this matter. Uh, it, it establishes binding programmatic obligations, uh, some of them very specific depending on the risk uh, classification of the AI systems and even prohibiting certain AI practices. What will be the impact of the European AI Act in Latin America? That's one of the questions uh, I think it's inter interesting to, to, uh, to address. This is a bit uh, speculative, but it, in my view, uh, it will take some time till we feel a substantial effect of the AI Act in, in this part of the world, South America. Sure, it will lead a, a way, as GDPR did with data privacy law, we may likely have some sectorial laws involving AI regulation for certain activities or industries, which I'm sure will be influenced by the AI Act. Now, having said that, I think in Latin America, we will have to wait till we see a local one fits all AI regulation similar to the European AI Act. I would say uh, a, couple of year, a couple of years at least. The reasons is it, it's brand new law, it has no antecedents, it is costly to implement, which is crucial in a, in a small economy like the South American one, and its scope is still unknown. Even the definition of artificial intelligence in AI is quite unclear and broad. But the use of AI systems and contracts involving such systems are, are here with us right now. So, that's, that leads us to the other question. What are companies doing uh, in, the minda, in the meantime, in, in, in this region of the world? From our work during the last year, we see companies uh, are drafting their own rules about uh, AI, including AI clauses in their IT contracts and in their internal policies. Those rules are different in each contract negotiation, of course, but they do have some patterns in common, which are based, in, based on the contingencies derived from AI happened during the last two years, mainly in the fields of privacy, copyright, uh, confidentiality, and labor law. And I'm sure most of you have heard about them. Uh, 
Uh, but let's review some of the key concerns and legal issues that, according to our experience, are included in, in contract and policies involving uh, AI systems. First, I would mention uh, defining the intended purpose of the AI system. Uh, in other words, the, the expected uh, deliverables, well, to, to use the term of uh, IT agreements. So, so what are the deliverables uh, or, or the aim of said system? What is, what is it supposed to do um, with its limitation, context, and conditions of use? Along with this comes the intended use uh, in addition to the purpose, depending on each company's models. The way each company intends to use the AI, the AI tool according with its business model uh, this is very important to assess legal risk. Uh, to give to a couple of examples, uh, image and code generation may pose uh, more risk than text generation. Uh, and of course, internal use uh, may pose less risk, uh, while external uses for, for customers may pose more risk. Second thing, uh, I would say distinguishing the different roles of the actors. The, the provider of the AI system, the distributor, and the deployer, would, which would, would be the company hiring the AI system. Uh, and foreseeing the position uh, of third parties would, would be actors too, uh, in the sense, usually the customer, uh, who may be users of a product or service derived in whole or in part uh, from. Uh, the output of an AI system. Of an AI system. Uh, this typically comes along with indem indemnity clauses, um, depend depending on, on the intended use, as I've said. Uh, this is also key uh, in indemnity clauses. Uh, then comes the output. Uh, as you know, in, in most AI tools, there's a and instructions, uh, you, give, you give the tool an input and, and then you have the output, which is the result of it. So um, predicting legal issues related with the output of an AI tool is crucial and becoming a standard in every AI contract. In determining who is the owner of such input, um, uh, who is responsible for it, uh, the restrictions on your ability to use the outputs and if such restrictions are acceptable to your engineering and business teams. Mitigating the liability risks derived from inaccurate outputs or inaccurate use of said outputs, because the output may be right, but they may be used in, in a wrong way. And defining the, the different scenarios in which the output may infringe third parties' rights, including, of course, IP rights, and the AI provides indemnification in some of these cases. Again, indemnity is, is crucial here. The data, uh, of course, used in AI systems uh, is important to define it in the, in the agreement of policies, uh, defining the provider's rights to use the customer's data as trading data. Some AI providers uh, will explicitly, explicitly say that they will not use customer information to trade their models, while some others reserve the right to do it, offering anonymization of the customer's data to protect it. Uh, this is uh, something that that's going on uh, uh, very often uh, during the last year. Then, of course, that the data deletion proceedings and compliance of the AI tool with the local data protection laws. And finally, I would mention employee training is also becoming a key factor. AI tools are starting to be massively used within a company, and their performance depends largely on the people that work in that company, those companies people that use them. So employees should be trained about how to use them and also uh, mainly uh, the legal implications of their use, the way they should design inputs and prompts to mitigate infringements. So to sum up, uh, I think it will take some time till mandatory AI laws are issued in, in Argentina and in, in Latin America. Uh, sector specific AI regulations might reasonably be expected in, in the short term, um, but not a generic AI uh, law. Uh, and meanwhile, companies are agreeing terms of use 
restrictions and liabilities of AI tools that they use. Private contractual terms are fulfilling the lack of, of, of AI regulation and case law. IP data privacy, inaccurate risks, employment law issues, and mitigating liability derived from those areas are currently the, the main legal concerns, including the process of AI policies and contracts. Hopefully, and, and I think probably, uh, along the months to come this year, those clauses will follow similar patterns, uh, creating in that way a, a new contractual standards for AI systems. Thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Caroline Leroy Blanvillain. I'm a French associate lawyer at Alerion, working with Corinne Chirage, partner lawyer. And we are now will be discussing the legal framework in France regarding AI. Our colleagues perfectly reminded the upcoming steps before entering into force of the EU AI Act. As for the French legal framework on September 12, 2023, a draft bill has been submitted to the French National Assembly by, it, by eight members of parliament to establish a copyright framework for artificial intelligence. The main points of this proposal are as follows. First, the integration of intellectual works into artificial intelligence software is subject to traditional copyright rules, meaning the authorization by the rights holder. Then, collective societies, SGC in French for Société de Gestion Collective, for AI-generated works are empowered to represent rights holders and collect remuneration for the exploitation of copied works. Then, on September the 19th, 2023, French Prime Minister set up the first interministerial committee on AI to discuss implication uh, of AI with regard to the laws to be adopted. The next step took place on October the 12th, 2023, where there was a press release from the Société des Auteurs, Compositeurs et Éditeurs de Musique, SACEM, announcing the exercise of its members' right to object, of doubt, to the use of their works by artificial intelligence tools in accordance with Article 122-5-3 of the, on the French Intellectual Property Code. For the entire SACEM repertoire, this data mining will require prior authorization from the organization. Then on January 25th, 2024, a letter was sent to Prime Minister Gabriel Attal, co-signed by 71 cultural organizations and collecting societies in charge of the collective management of rights for authors. They're calling for greater respect of copyright by generative AI for press, animation, cinema, music, publishing, etc which would imply greater transparency regarding the content used to train in AI systems. Regarding specifically intellectual property laws in France, copyright infringement remains one of the most important issues and it occurs at several stages in the use of AI. But before that, we need to focus on the protection of AI tools and technology in France by the law. Some thoughts on protection under intellectual property law, as the protection of software does not seem to pose any specific difficulties for AI. What about the protection of the algorithm, the training data, and the inference model? First, the algorithm. French courts seem to exclude protection of the algorithm itself, meaning the sequence of steps, without, however, clearly specifying the details of their reasoning. The doctrine seems to regard this sequence of steps as an abstraction on par with ideas which are essentially unproductable as well as functionalities which the Court of Justice of the European Union excludes from the scope of protectable objects without, however, clearly defining them neither. 
forms of expression of the program, as well as preparatory design work likely to result in the reproduction or subsequent realization of the program, will be eligible for protection, subject, of course, to their originality. These include, for example, the source and object codes implementing the algorithm, the analysis file, the technical specifications, and the diagrams describing the processes to be carried out. Considering the algorithm as an idea renders then copyright protections totally ineffective. It would then fall within the exceptions for reverse engineering as set out in Article 122-6. Point one of the French Intellectual Property Code and 5.3 of the Directive 2009-24, dated April 23rd, 2009. The change, changes of the algorithm being protected under common copyright law are equally slim if it remains assimilated to IDs, the latter also being excluded from such protection. Then, on training data sets. We can say that AI software needs to be trained on data set to learn how to perform its intended function. Copyright can protect unauthorized reproductions or representations, data, as well as the structure of the database that collects those, provided that these are original. In the case of AI, Protection of the structure can be strongly affected by the quality of the author of these choices. The French Sui Generis Database Right protects the content of the database against unauthorized extraction and or reuse of a substantial part of it, regardless of its originality. It should be noted that the European Data Act regulation specifies that the sui generis right on databases does not apply to databases obtained or generated by means of physical components, such as sensors, connected products, and our services linked to them, which uh, include other machine-generated data that can be transposed for algorithms. Then, when it comes to AI and data, many questions arise as to how data sets are constituted, particularly with regard to the application of the text and data mining exception provided for in Directive 2019-790 of April 17, 2019, translated into French law with ordinance number 2021-15-18, dated November 24, 2021. As regard to the inference models, copyright protections is likely to run up against the same difficulties. With the idea of protecting the inference model under sui generis database law, the model would then be considered as a database whose parameters would be the data. Even if the notion of database has a broad scope, this seems questionable. Indeed, it seems that obtaining this production could be limited by excluding the assessments made to create the data. As for the inclusion of investments linked to the optimization of parameters, it seems equally questionable as these do not seem to be really linked to the verification, to the verification of data reliability during the life of the database, nor to its presentation as mentioned earlier. Finally, on the copyright issues upstream of the AI use that we will see first before uh, the other copyright issues during uh, AI use. Copyright infringement can occur upstream of AI use, particularly during the learning phase. The databases used to train the AI system may in fact include numerous works protected by copyright without necessarily obtaining the consent of the authors of the work's content. AI solutions can be created from protected source code, including pieces of code that are not necessarily open source. Blocking the web crawlers has reportedly been implemented by a number of media, including Radio France and TF1 major uh, media firms in France. Media players would be willing to negotiate to organize the sharing of value via, for example, licensing and remuneration agreements. Collecting content published by the media without remuneration for the work in the public interest could call into question the press's business model. 
but the use of these blockers must be part of a well thought out strategy. First, blockers limit copyright infringement by restricting the collection of protected content, but they also limit the promotion and distribution of content via AI systems and prevent the AI from being trained on quality content, which would improve the quality of the results provided. In this way, the decision is part of an equitable distribution of content value. And in particular, uh, concerning this sharing of value, Member of Parliament Guillaume Vulté, uh, who is uh, responsible for the bill enabling AI companies to be taxed in order to pay remuneration to content creators of the model of collective management societies that we mentioned before for the SGC, Société de Gestion Collective. Such a sharing of value would be based on statistics on the use of works for the one hand, and implementation of a tax for the benefit of the collective management organization on AI generative content, whose origin cannot be determined on the other hand, meaning, for example, a fraction of sales. Besides, right holders may object in an appropriate manner, in particular by means of machine-readable processes for content made available to the public online. In practice, this objection can be made in digital writing without any specific IT protection and can be integrated into an automatic rights management system. However, it must be accompanied by a declaration and cannot be merely a technical protection. Though, this possibility is limited in reality, as the opt-out is neither sufficiently applied nor respected when it is acquired. First, on the application on the right of opposition set forth in Directive 2019-790, this would not hold use of copyrighted works by AI would be covered. Indeed, the three criteria for verifying the legitimacy of the application of the exception are clearly not met. In fact, the new uses of generative AI are expressly aimed at undermining intellectual property law and altering the value of the content produced. The prejudice to authors is undeniable, since some companies have already considerably reduced their use of external service providers for artistic tasks, entrusting them instead to generative AI software. The exception provided for in their directive should therefore not apply to AI needs, but since it does not meet the three conditions set out in the directive recital. Moreover, the ordinance transposing the directive into French law reduces the scope for opposition to mere authors and not to all right holders. Secondly, one of the provisions of the AI Act is that the data used to train an AI must be published. This publication could give rise to a significant number of disputes unless the creators of AI systems manage to justify the use, notably through the exception to copyright for search if the consent has not been opted out. And finally, our last part, what are the copyright issues when using AI? Data entered by the user in the AI prompt may include intellectual property or data covered with business secrecy. Then, what happens to the data supplied by the user of the AI? Once in its possession, what degree of protection is provided by the AI? For example, the problem seems to have been encountered by the Korean company Samsung in May 2022, when a company engineer allegedly leaked sensitive lines of code by entering them into the GPT chat prompt. The company subsequently banned the use of Gen AI technologies, but uh, this prevented them from obtaining a patent in the US for the concerned uh, products coded. The new version of the AI Act enshrines the opt-out principle, which means that as a matter of principle, Gen AI can be trained on copyrighted content unless the authors expressly reserve their rights over the work. This principle is based on Article 122-5 and Article 122-5-3 of the French Intellectual Property Code, which set out the exception or limitation for text and data mining. For its part, the French bill that we previously mentioned 
aimed, on the contrary, at providing a copyright framework for artificial intelligence subject to their authorization by the authors or right holders. Then, what's next? In France, this principle has entailed a debate opposing the French government and the cultural institutions, as well as the authors or their representatives. Indeed, while the government is in favor of more flexibility, the main French cultural institutions, as presented above, hold concerns to the French prime minister, thus positioning in favor of the adult principle. Thank you for listening and re remain available for the Q&As. Hi, my name is Gina Trisida and I'm a principal in Russell Kennedy Lawyers in Australia and I'm pleased to talk to you today about our regulatory landscape for artificial intelligence. First of all, we have the obligatory disclaimer that this is general commentary only. If you would like advice on any of the topics we've discussed, please feel free to get in contact with me directly. So what we want to cover today is um, Australian regulation of AI, first of all. Uh, Australian businesses using AI are already subject to a whole a range of different uh, existing legislation in Australia, but we want to talk a little bit about the specific regulation that's going to be coming in, which includes new regulatory guardrails specific for AI. Um, as that's going to take a little while to come in, we also want to talk about some of the immediate actions that the Australian government is, is taking to deal with community concerns around AI and some updates to existing laws that are going to be coming in. And also, I want to talk a little bit just about some guidance that the Australian government has put out for use of AI in the Australian public service, as that can be useful to look at as potential best practice, even in the private sector. So first of all, uh, the potential for AI systems and applications uh, to improve well-being, quality of life and the economy is well known. It's been estimated that um, adopting AI and automation in Australia could add an additional $170 billion to $600 billion a year to Australia's GDP by 2030. But there are some, uh, there are some concerns um, it, within the Australian public. I've put up on the slide a quote by the Minister for Industry and Science, which says, Australians understand the value of artificial intelligence, but they want to see the risks identified and tackled, and they want stronger guardrails to manage higher risk AI in Australia. So at the moment, there is, there's low public trust in Australia that AI systems are being designed and used safely and responsibly. Um, and so this is what uh, the Australian government is seeking to protect, uh, to address with the new regulations that, that they're designing at the moment. Australia is closely monitoring how other countries are responding to the challenges of AI. And in November last year, Australia was one of the signatories to the Bletchley Declaration, along with the EU, the US, the UK and China and about 30 countries altogether. Uh, this was at the AI Safety Summit. And Australia was affirming that AI should be designed, developed, deployed and used in a manner that is safe, human centric, trustworthy and responsible. And that we're going to work with the international community to make sure that those guide rails are in place. So how does that impact on regulation in Australia specifically? Well, uh, in June last year, the Australian government consulted with industry on it by putting out a discussion paper on the safe and responsible AI in Australia. And just recently on the 17th of January, the Australian government put out its inter interim response to that consultation, talking about uh, the actions and uh, things they're going to put in place to, to deal with the concerns that were raised in the submissions responding to that consultation paper. In particular, that inter interim response indicated that the Australian government is going to put in a, to place a risk-based management approach to regulation of AI in Australia. Uh, the, the responses to the consultation paper made it clear that in Australia, we want to ensure that the use of AI systems for legitimate but high risk settings is safe and can be relied upon. So implementing regulation in that sphere, but uh, for other areas like where there are low risk settings, the, the general feeling in Australia is that that should be unimpeded and it should be very light touch regulation, if any, with regard to those low risk settings. 
So what might be considered high risk in the Australian context is where the AI could possibly result in harms that are likely significant or difficult to reverse. So examples given were uh, the use of AI enabled robots for medical surgery, where if the robot makes a mistake, it's quite possibly irreversible or the use of AI in self-driving cars to make real real time decisions. And what would be considered low risk would be use of AI uh, for things like uh, the optimization of business operations. So where we're talking about these new regulatory guardrails in high risk settings, uh, the government is going to consult further on options, but it looks as though the guardrails will target uh, three key areas being testing, transparency and accountability. So where we're talking about testing, this could include having both internal and external testing of AI systems, both before and after release. And this could include using independent experts for those testing. Uh, with regard to transparency, this could include requiring uh, AI systems to uh, have some sort of labelling or watermarking to show where the system itself uses AI or where content is uh, generated by AI. Uh, it could also include a public reporting on what data is being used to train the AI model itself. And lastly, accountability. This could include having designated roles within organisations uh, for people to have responsibility for AI safety and also requiring specific training for developers and deployers of AI products in certain settings. Now, implementing these new regulatory guardrails is, of course, going to take some time. The government is still consulting with industry on these issues, uh, but there is pressure to take action immediately. So these are the immediate actions that the Australian government is looking at. Working with industry to develop a voluntary AI safety standard, working with industry to develop options for voluntary labelling and watermarking of AI generated materials, and establishing an expert advisory group to support the development of options for the mandatory guardrails that we've just discussed. Also, uh, they, we were talking about a specific regulation aimed at AI, but as I mentioned, there are a lot of uh, laws and frameworks in Australia that already uh, deal with AI or are relevant to the use and development of AI. And so the government is looking at updating those existing laws um, and expanding them so that they address specific community concerns with, with AI. So some examples for that include uh, implementing an independent statutory review of the Online Safety Act, um, which deals with uh, digital platforms addressing online harms uh, specific to AI, such as the malicious use of generative AI, including things like producing child exploitation material. Uh, there's, there've been, uh, the government has been working on privacy law reforms for some time now, and some of those will be specific to AI. Looking at agreeing an Australian framework for the use of generative AI in schools. Uh, looking at producing a regulatory framework for automated vehicles in Australia, and also working on principles like security by design in the government's Australian cyber security strategy. Uh, so these are just some examples. There, there's quite a number of things that the government is working on at the moment. And I just thought I would also look uh, just briefly at AI in the Australian Public Service because uh, in September last year, the Digital Transformation Agency and the Department of Industry, Science and Resources established the Artificial Intelligence and Government Task Force. And, and, and this has been quite useful. There's been interim guidance on government use of public generative AI tools that's been put out that was updated in November last year. And quite helpfully, it includes these two golden rules for use of generative AI in the Australian Public Service, which is that you should be able to explain, justify, and take ownership of your advice and decisions. And you should assume that any information you input into public generative AI tools could become public. So don't input anything that could reveal classified, personal, or otherwise sensitive information. And I think that this is helpful. It only applies to the Australian Public Service, but um, according to a, a recent survey, two thirds of workers in, in Australian uh, workplaces are actually using these sorts of generative AI tools like ChatGPT. 
And this is despite about a quarter of Australian workplaces actually banning them at the moment. So I think the issue is that workers are going to be using these sorts of tools at work, uh, regardless of whether their organisation bans them or not. So what we really need is good policies and procedures in place. So I guess internal guard guardrails, as it were, for how um, employers in private sector organisations should be using these sorts of tools to ensure that they comply with the law and minimise the risks to the business. And so I think that looking at things like the uh, guidelines that the Australian Public Service puts in place can be a good uh, check for best practice when private sector organisations are determining what they're going to put in their own policies. So to summarise, I guess um, artificial intelligence is here, we cannot escape it, and it presents some amazing opportunities for businesses in all different sorts of industries. Uh, the challenge is in order to make the most of artificial intelligence, the private sector in Australia really needs to be across the existing laws uh, that are in place that apply to their use and development of AI, but they also need to keep an eye on them and, and keep up to date with the rapidly evolving regulatory landscape. So um, I hope that this was helpful. And if you have any questions about the regulation of AI in Australia, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Art Dicker, and uh, today I'm here to talk about regulations on artificial intelligence in China. Um, we're going to have to be quick today. We've got a, a very short time period to, to walk through this presentation, so I'll try to be super efficient. Um, Myself, very quickly, I'm senior counsel at RNP China Lawyers. We are a boutique but full service firm in predominantly Shanghai uh, with the Beijing office as well. Um, I've got 16 years experience working in China as a lawyer, doing cross border work, uh, fluent in Chinese, my education. I started over in, in China at another firm um, based out of San Francisco called Morrison Forster. I've also spent time in house at a Silicon Valley company called Cadence Design Systems in their Shanghai office. I mentioned a bit about our firm, uh, RNP. Like I said, we've got about 50 lawyers between Shanghai and Beijing. Um, we are a local firm, so we can advise completely on local law. Um, we also have a lot of a heavy presence of senior foreign lawyers who can uh, interpret and explain things in, lang in language that might be easier for you to understand. Um, I'm going to jump right into it again because we don't have a lot of time. Um, there's the the regulatory framework for AI in China, of course, like everywhere, is evolving and evolving quickly. And in some ways, in China, it is evolving faster than other places. And I think what's really driving this is that China senses the upside and also the downside, frankly, of AI, um, maybe more so than other people uh, or other governments. Um, so they're trying to get ahead of this um, and put regulation in place before things get a bit quote, out of control uh, on, on generation of content and so forth that maybe they don't find acceptable. I think that's in the background to everything we talk about here today. Um, the primary regulator is the CAC, which you may know if you know about data privacy and other things is similar, the same regulator that's come out with a lot of the data regulations recently as well. Um, We've got a, a set of regulations that are on the books. We've got one in draft form that I'll talk about as well. Um, one on algorithms, one on deep synthesis, and one on uh, generative AI. Uh, there are also trial measures for ethical review of science and technology activities. Uh, again, pressing right ahead. Um, so the scope, I've mixed the, I've kind of mixed the scopes together um, uh, as we get further into the presentation, but at the high level in the beginning, uh, deep synthesis, what are we talking about? Technologies that utilize generative and synthetic algorithms, such as deep learning, virtual reality. There's, you can see on the right, I put kind of a, a graph of how these things overlap, generative AI being broader than deep synthesis. Um, the generative AI regulations were originally going to be uh, uh, much stricter um, and uh, less lenient, let's say, as this is evolving, but they've been somewhat watered down. They provide, they, they apply to service providers and technical support companies, developers, and so forth. Uh, noteworthy is when when the services are being provided to the public. So for private, it's not strictly falling under this regulation. Algorithm reg recommendations is something we all know about from the social media apps we use and so e-commerce and so forth. 
um, that should be pretty familiar to people. Again, moving right along because of the time crunch. Um, so some of the basic duties, um, China likes to make you do filings for things as anyone who's experienced um, working in, and uh, running a business in China or close to China. Um, so there's a, you potentially have to file the algorithm with the with CAC um, and with the, some of the trigger events, which you'll see in other places as well as public opinion and uh, attributes or social mobilization capabilities Kind of a weird way to phrase it but we're talking about things like chat rooms blogs webcasts social media um we take the conservative position that it's likely pretty much any ai product is going to have to do some kind of a filing uh, and again we're talking about coverage for service providers and and technical support providers uh, likely the service providers are going to be the primary ones filing i should say and then of course Content moderation, like anything in China, if you're running a website, you you are ultimately responsible for the content that's coming out of that, and you had that's a huge burden for for internet and other technology companies in China, knowing that the government is very interested in controlling what kind of content is put out there in the public space. So along those lines, um, similar if the similar for the filing requirement triggers, you'll see material change, public opinion, so forth. Um, and disseminating illegal and harmful information potentially triggers a security assessment report as well. It's it's you again. You're going to see a lot of the parallels to the data regulations. The data regulations also have it's kind of a security uh, assessment um, if you're dealing with large amounts potentially of uh, personal information and sort of important uh, data and so forth. So you see kind of the where they're borrowing from. They're borrowing from the uh, the data regulations, which are relatively new as well. Um, you can see some of the requirements here. Again, the onus is put on the provider um, to self-police uh, as much as possible. Um, so you can, I won't go through the, all of them. I think you can see them there. They, they make sense what they're trying to require people to do in the security report. As to the data itself, um, you know, again, a basic requirement, which shouldn't be too surprising, is that the, you know, the, the data that you're using to train um, it has to be from lawful sources, right? Again, the, we know that's an issue these days as well. And some controversy about that here in the US as well. Again, if if you're pulling this data, if you're using this data, you have to make sure that, it, again, if it's personal information that's contained in that data, then you have to, of course, get consent. And that goes right back to PIPL, uh, the Personal Information Protect, uh, Protection Law, DSL, Data Security Law, CSL, Cybersecurity Law. This is the, the triumvirate framework of the data regulations in China, these three rules. So you can see, again, tied very closely together. Uh, you ha uh, have to take effective measures for the authenticity or accuracy of the data, which obviously is potentially a huge burden. Um, it's been watered down a little bit. The original draft was ensure. Now you just have to have effective measures. Um, so that's, you know, you don't have to necessarily catch everything, but you at least have to have a good program in place for trying to catch things, basically what it comes down to. Um, you must have clear rules for data labeling. Um, you must have, again, this is this might be a little more uniquely China, in a Chinese context. You have to have, uh, make sure content is pre presented in or data presented in a, in a mainstream value orientation. So basically what the narrative of the government is, you need to be consistent with that and make sure that what you're, you're, the data that you're generating, the content that you're generating um, is, is consistent with those values. Um, let's move quickly again. We're, we don't have a lot of time. User rights. So it should be familiar and kind of self-explanatory. Um, the basic principles of your algorithm need to be made public. Um, content that is um, uh, deep synthetic needs to be labeled as such. Uh, the, the basic terms of use, you need to get consent if the specific kind of data is involved, as we talked about. Um, there's going to be specific rights potentially that you're going to have as a user to opt out of things. Again, very similar to the data regulations. Here we're talking about pricing, getting getting out of the recommendation system altogether, being targeted, tags, et cetera. I mentioned the, the ethical review at the top. This is still evolving. We're not sure how important this is going to play into it. But it's the you know going to universities and science research institu institutions that are going to be at the forefront of driving this AI. We want to make sure that there's some kind of um, framework to make sure that they're taking ethics into account. Penalties, as as is not to be surprised with Chinese regulations. Again, monetary penalties for Chinese all Chinese regulations 
by Western standards are relatively light. It's never the risk of monetary penalties that you're worried about. It's the risk of reputational damage, um, potentially impact to the rest of your business. The monetary penalties, like again, data security, any other kind of regulation in China, monetary penalties are relatively light. The risk is the impact to your overall business, reputationally or otherwise coming from the government. Uh, and a foreign company that doesn't have a site in China or doesn't have a direct product in China uh, may not have their company shut down, may not have their local site shut down, but may be blocked by the firewall, the great firewall in China, which uh, you know Facebook and YouTube are blocked for and have been for years now. Um, we're coming up in about 10 minutes, so that's about good with the timing. Um, there's an interesting copyright case, which I won't spend too much time going into, but the and people in China are really not sure how many how much um, sort of legs this is going to have. But um, there's a copyright case recently in Beijing Internet Court that found that AI generated artwork is protected by copyright. And so that's been a um, very interesting ruling. And we're going to see how that evolves. Like I said, um, that's such an open question these days, as, as we know. So that's um, it's worth noting here. And, I'm, and we've got about 10 minutes um, on the 10 minute mark. I just want to um, finish up with um, a discussion of the draft AI law, which is coming up. So. Um, we've talked about the, sort of the three regulations that have that have come out so far, kind of um, piecemeal. Um, and again, China really is kind of ahead of the curve um, getting some of this regulations out there. Uh, and not to be surprised, there is um, sort of a draft rule that's circulating out, out there. And this is how things typically happen. A draft rule often by university professors or other commentators in the industry will work together, uh, kind of these government-backed think tanks. And so there could be... Uh, we're on the lookout for an overarching framework that's going to come out. Um, what's unique is uh, interesting is if you know anything about how foreign investment in general is governed in China, um, I think they're going to be drawing some lessons from that. And so China, like other countries, but 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 only some other countries, has this thing called the foreign investment catalog and basically has a negative list. So certain kinds of industries are either required to be permitted or completely banned from foreign investment. And I and it seems like they're gonna borrow a similar kind of concept for the introduction of AI products in, in China. Certain uh, AI business products are gonna to need to um, have a permit, um, just like you have to get a certain business scope approved in China for, and for starting a business. Uh, specific AI business products, AI products are gonna to need to set, potentially have a, a specific permit for them. Um, we're still not sure exactly how this is going to work again, as far as like our, our foreign company is going to be allowed to play in this space, how much. Um, it seems like there might be some requirements potentially to have uh, a local company have to do it, which would again be very similar to how the um, internet companies in general are regulated in China, uh, potentially having to be a, have a, a you know, legal rep or a person in charge being a, a Chinese citizen. Um, and so we're also going to see an algorithm filing system. Um, and so that's it's very similar to um, some of the licenses around the internet, uh, having an internet business, this internet content provider license in China, where if you're operating a basic website, you need to do a filing. And if you're doing a uh, commercial website, you need to get a permit. Similar idea here. If you've got um, a certain kind of AI product, you might need to get a permit. If you if you don't, but it's still somewhat it's related to AI, you may just need to do a filing. So it should be of no surprise that the uh, the draft is borrowing on a lot of the themes and concepts, way of doing things in other regulations like data regulations in China and uh, internet businesses in China. And that's it. So we've got about twelve and a half minutes. I tried to fit it into the time frame. Um, if you want to reach out to me or, or our firm. Um, our contact information is here. Again, we have offices in Shanghai and Beijing. We have full service covering China. Um, uh, any kind of legal matters you may need to support, um, my email is there. And thank you very much for your attention today. Thanks, everybody, for attending this webinar again. Uh, we have, um, uh, for the last part, some questions that the um, participants submitted to us when they registered to the webinar. Uh, due to the obvious time restrictions we have, uh, I made a, 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 an outline, a little summary of these questions uh, that I have here. So let's start with with a couple of questions to Nick. 
Um, so, uh, Nick, here's one, one question for you. Is there likely, I'm reading it, is, is there likely to be any reform of the UK's Copyright Act, Copyright Act to make the position clearer uh, regarding AI and copyright? So in, in terms of, in thanks, thanks, Lissandro. In, 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 I suppose in terms of actual reform, so changing, amending, amending the actual statute, I think that's unlikely. Um, we've, we've sort of had a consultation a few years ago, and although there's probably a need for reform, there's no, absolutely no consensus on what we would change to. So we've kind of given up on that for the time being. I think that's kind of a bit, a bit too difficult. But I think what there will be, almost certainly before very long, is there will be a case or cases which kind of in, kind of help interpret that that piece of the law. So obviously, as a as essentially a common law jurisdiction, we we rely quite a lot on our case law to to interpret our statutes. Um, so I'm not I'm not aware of a case coming through that there is a there is an AI copyright case, Getty Images and Stability AI. Which is sort of working its way through the courts. Um, just had a strike out summary judgment application, but um, that, as far as I'm aware, that doesn't touch on sort of ownership of uh, of AI created AI created works. But uh, there will almost certainly be a case coming along at some point. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Nick. Uh, just two more. Uh, the second one is 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 broader. Uh, what do you prefer, the UK's wait and see approach or the European Union's regulate now approach? Yeah, thank you. Something much. more political, right? Yeah, well, I'll try not to be political. Um, that suppose that was the question that I tried to duck in my little presentation, but they are, they are really different approaches, um, and you can kind of see you can kind of see some benefits and some disadvantages in both. So I, I do actually quite like the the UK system, um, or what, what the UK is saying, which is saying, you know, essentially um, it's all a bit new. It's very very fast moving. You know, we've only had Chat GPT for just over a year. It's just too soon to start trying to just trying to start trying to regulate the the whole area. Um, it's best if we just sort of wait and see, and then deal with it as the problems arise. Um, and I suppose. But from from the from an EU point of view, I think you would say that um, if you do it if you do it that way, if you do it the UK's way, you're going to end up with quite a sort of patchwork approach, a sort of sector by sector approach, uh, and you may well end up with a not very coherent, slightly messy system with a few with a few gaps in it. So I can see um, I can see the advantages in both. Um, I think right now, not knowing too much about the AI, the EU's AI Act, I probably prefer the UK's sort of wait and see, um, try not to sort of try not to suppress any sort of any um, any technology. Um, so I think I probably prefer that, but we'll have to see how that develops, I think. OK, thank you. And the last to you, Nick, uh, question that I would like to ask to all of you. Uh, what do you think about the the impact of the European AI Act will have in the rest of jurisdictions, in UK or other countries? Will, will it be like GDPR or? Yeah, so so I think I, I said I'll go first if you like. So I think I said as I said in my presentation, there is this sort of extra extra territorial, almost like grasping effect, which is very similar to GDPR as as I as I read it. Um, so there's, there's definitely going to have a sort of effect outside of the EU. Um, what's a bit to me, what's more difficult to know is that so with GDPR, that almost became the standard, and you saw and you kind of saw GDPR being mimicked a little bit, country to country to country outside the EU. But what what I don't know is whether we are going to get that sort of mimicking effect, and the EU AI Act is going to be the gold standard. I just don't know enough at this time, but. There must be a fair chance of history repeating itself and that, you know, that, that being rolled out across the world. We'll, we'll have to see. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. 
so the next the next questions the next couple of questions here are addressed uh, to Sean. Um, uh, so Sean, uh, what do you think? What do the AI risk assessment look? Uh, you mentioned look, look like in, in practice. This is a very uh, this is a question I, I often hear uh, because uh, lawyers uh, uh, often do not know what uh, what does it look like. How is it? How, that do do you do an AI risk assessment? Yeah, it's it's a great question. Um, thank you. And I think in particular for the US, the question is kind of it depends. Um, and it is largely going to be jurisdiction specific. So as I mentioned a couple of times in, in the presentation there, I think the first thing is um, I, I wouldn't know the answer state by state. For example, if you're in California, that answer is likely different than if you're in uh, Michigan or Florida or what have you. So number one, check your specific jurisdiction. Um, but the broader question, you know, for businesses in really any state, especially those that don't have the comprehensive data privacy laws, um, and looking forward to potential federal regulation, um, I would point companies um, and others to there's a draft uh, memo that was put out by the White House's Office of Management and Budget. Um, so just for folks who are interested in Googling that, the title is Proposed Memorandum for the Heads of Executive Departments and Agencies. Again, that's the Office of Management and Budget. And I think that gives us a, a broad sense of what the government has in mind um, for basic building blocks for these assessments. I'll go through it really quickly. One is um, assessing and documenting, importantly. Uh, one, the intended purpose for the AI, and this is all very general, but important, um, it's expected benefit. And, and this is a concrete recording of quantifiable measures of, of positive outcomes, for example, for the company by using the AI. Um, examples that are given are reducing costs, re reducing uh, wait times uh, for consumers or others, reducing risks to human life. So you really wanna crystallize those benefits. Like why are we doing this? Um, and what is the purpose? Uh, second, the potential risks, right? Um, making sure that there's visibility on that, assessing possible failure modes um, and sort of echoing one of my main points, um, being attentive to potential risks to underserved communities. Um, lastly, assessing and documenting the quality and appropriateness of the relevant data, um, making sure there's visibility um, into uh, the inputs, which which can be inscrutable, right? But companies really should um, have a pin on that, be constantly assessing it and documenting it, um, making sure that it's uh, quality, right? And fit for the purpose that was enumerated in the, in the initial building block. So again, um, I recommend Googling that, looking up that memo. I think it gives in broad strokes, uh, uh, really useful guidance for those okay. risks assessments. Okay, okay. And talking about risks and liability, which is one of the biggest concerns about using AI, uh, could you could you uh, uh, explain the the impact of the negligence per se concept in in the context of AI use? Yeah, I'll try to be fast about this one. Thank you. Um, another good question. So. Uh, really, we've seen this, as I mentioned, with respect to data security. Um, the difference that I see in plaintiffs potentially using uh, Section 5 as a means to establish a duty that companies would violate with respect to AI is really letting private plaintiffs into the world of suing companies for how companies use AI, notwithstanding the absence of a private right of action um, for that respect. So you're moving from a... a regulator-driven enforcement. Regulators you know, should have a good faith basis to bring any sort of enforcement action or inspection, and, and that's okay, that's their job. Really, the negligence per se, which again, imports the requirements of Section 5 of the FTC Act that I had talked about, to stand in place of a duty that companies have would be the argument. So negligence, uh, the four elements are uh, uh, duty, a duty exists, a breach of that duty, 
a causation resulting in harm. So one of those four building blocks is the duty. I, I you know, worry, I guess uh, would be the word, that uh, private plaintiffs will import a duty from Section 5 um, relating to proper use of AI and then bring a bunch of class action lawsuits across the, the country um, that may not be brought on a good faith basis, that may uh, increase essentially the cost of doing business for companies. Um, and that's why establishing and following these basic building blocks for the use of AI, um, not, not just for the regulators, super important, but also to position companies to, to be appropriately defensive, to hopefully knock these kinds of suits out early, right, and efficiently um, is really important. I, I could talk about that for a long time, but I think we'll okay, yeah, stop there for now. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The question was very broad, so thanks for being uh, concise in the response. And thank you, Alex. Um, next couple of questions addressed to Caroline. Um, Caroline, uh, the 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 European Union took quite a long time to finalize the AI Act. Consequently, generative AI was taken into consideration lately. Would you say that? text uh, efficiently addresses generative AI regulation? Yes, thank you, Alessandra. This is a very interesting question, as uh, actually what we could observe was that uh, indeed the EU um, institutions uh, integrated the generative AI questions uh, when this started to be uh, an issue. Uh, in the public place. And there is this discussion uh, between uh, professionals um, uh, about the fact that uh, generative AI is not actually efficiently addressed in the UAI Act because it was uh, implemented very at the very end of the discussion of the text and many aspects of uh, implications of uh, generative AI um, were not sufficiently um, discussed between it's institutions. Not, it is not defined. It is not among the Yes, definitions. actually, and there, there, there are no uh, specific provisions in some articles of the text um, uh, that address directly to generative AI. Therefore, there is no particular uh, consideration for generative AI versus discriminative AI, for example, whereas uh, audits of these solutions are very different. So uh, how the, the, the AI uh, risk assessment should be made between a discriminative AI and a generative AI, there are necessarily uh, distinctions to be operated and this is not sufficiently addressed uh, by the text. So we are really waiting for the guidelines that will be issued uh, by uh, European board and national board uh, and authorities for AI, because this will be of crucial importance regarding uh, the, the regulation of generative AI. Okay, thanks a lot. And the second last question, uh, it's related to the one, uh, the last one I, I made to, to, to Nick is, uh, uh, what do you think the impact of the AI Act uh, will be in the rest of the world? Uh, in, other, in other words, uh, the European Union is clearly in advance with regards to regulating AI. Do you think there might be discrepancies between the compliance programs to be carried out in, in, in Europe and in the rest of the world? Actually, with the new uh, data package uh, adopted uh, within the European Union, including the AI Act, it's like uh, the the European Union find, found a, a recipe, a recipe that is working, uh, found with GDPR, at first, and uh, that was efficient because uh, first the, there was a sufficiently adhesion from uh, companies from EU and overseas uh, or ex-EU uh, companies, uh, but also 
but also because it's it, it didn't prevent companies from doing business abroad. And this was a major uh, criticism of the text at the beginning that was not a, a real concern, but often heard. Um, and uh, my opinion on this is that there will necessarily be uh, some uh, some tries uh, some companies will have to try first uh, doing compliance um, with the, the EU AI Act um, and they uh, they will be change of parad uh, of paradigm uh, in the compliance programs but this will necessarily impact the whole company for companies operating um, worldwide and we have a lot for example in france so they start to be really concerned with their compliance program to the ai act um, because it, it, they they cannot uh, implement um, uh, compliance program that is too different between the EU on the one hand and the rest of the world on the other hand. So um, compliance programs these days are also uh, leveraging uh, the 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 overall uh, compliance uh, vision, um, and it uh, it uh, obliges. Uh, companies to make particular efforts to provide a minimal level, a minimum level of of compliance and of awareness to these questions, uh, in all their um, in all their entities in the world. Okay, well, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks again to all of the speakers, uh, to the attendees. Uh, thanks, Meg for brilliantly organizing this and with Inari Law. Uh, I think this is a super hot matter. Uh, the European AI Act will be, is expected to be formally approved by April. Uh, this will trigger legal consequences. So we might, uh, we haven't decided yet, but we might organize another webinar uh in 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 toward the end of the year right well thanks everybody and see you again thank you all hello everyone thank you very much for um sitting through that that was a, a quick whip around the world of uh ai regulation um i'm gina Trusita from russell kennedy lawyers in australia and we've got um Taketo Natsu from Blakemore and Mitsuki in Japan as well. We were hoping to have a uh, uh, Dicker from China, who you've just heard from, but he was unable to make it today. So uh, if you have got any questions that you would like us to address, please feel free to put them in the, uh, the Q&A. We thought we'd just probably hang around for maybe 10, 15 minutes just to see if there's anybody has any questions that they'd like to ask us. Um, and in the meantime, we might just uh, talk amongst ourselves, Taketo. One of the things that I um, thought was interesting was about the, the landscape for AI developers in Australia, because the CSIRO has just recently received, um, put out a, a report on the AI ecosystem in Australia, and they have called um, Australian AI companies young and nimble. The average age of an AI company in Australia is about six years. Uh, but we've got about 550 AI companies, which might not sound like much, but that is actually probably on par um, with some of the leading AI countries in the world in terms of, you know, proportionate to our population. Um, but what look, it looks like what we're leaning towards in Australia is business applications and adoption activities more than building brand new AI, AI technological products. Um, so where sort of where is our niche in the in the international market is probably niche AI specializations and capabilities, um, and so that's probably going to be the way that Australian AI companies find their way into global markets. I imagine it's probably a bit different in Japan. Yes, uh, I think uh, it's still a minority uh, uh, that a company uh, has already uh, started using AI uh, either by a developer or a user. 
most of the company uh, is now considering to start using AI <laughs> uh, as a developer uh, or uh, maybe uh, as a user. So uh, many companies are interested in whether or not uh, the, uh, there are some risks of uh, generative AI to develop uh, by themselves or uh, using the, uh, another provider's AI. So uh, it sounds uh, interesting that the, uh, even though uh, there are many uh, small sites, uh, but uh, quite a few uh, companies uh, are established in Australia uh, to develop the generative AI. Generative AI is a, a really interesting topic, and I think it's really generative AI that has captured the world's imagination when it comes to AI, because I think we all know that AI has been used for, for decades, back to when they first had those uh, the computers that were programmed to play chess against chess masters. Right, right. But it's when people are looking at chat GPT and the videos that are coming out from Sora that the general population has just become so interested. Um, and... Of course, that means that um, a, a lot of businesses are are now probably thinking for the first time about whether they should use these technologies in their business. And I think that uh, what we've found, at least, is that probably two thirds of office workers in Australia are already using things like ChatGPT, possibly without permission from their employer. So it's so we're sort of looking at um, every every organisation is looking at what sort of guardrails they're going to put in place internally to make sure that they're not. Uh, breaching laws. Mm -hmm. um, you a lot of your presentation was about uh, copyright and copyright infringement, and I wondered if you had a view also about performers' rights and and moral rights in artwork and literary works mm -hmm. and things like that. Yes, uh, there have been, there have been some uh, hot uh, debate among uh, commentators in Japan to uh, make uh, guidelines for AI versus copyright, but uh, the uh, debate uh, lacked uh, the standpoint of uh, moral rights and the performance rights. As a matter of fact, uh, the there is uh, already a provision uh, that the uh, performance right uh, will be subject to the uh, uh, limitation uh, of rights, like uh, Article uh, 30 hyphen 4. Or, but uh, I think uh, a further uh, discussion should be necessary because uh, performance right is slightly different from the uh, copyright. For example, the performance right is limited to the uh, copy or public transport, uh, public transmitter or something else. And as for the uh, moral rights, uh, there are some uh, um, criticized the article uh, which uh, provides that the uh, moral rights uh, should be free from the uh, limitation clause. But uh, when, when uh, we see uh, some judicial uh, precedents, uh, especially in Tokyo District Court, and um, they try to uh, limit the scope of uh, the provision, and then uh, try to uh, lead a reasonable conclusion in, in line with the, the uh, limitation of copyright. So I don't think uh, there will be some serious problem in the future as to the moral right, uh, even though the uh, generative uh, AI has developed this and uh, some copyright owners uh, alleges uh, the infringement of moral rights. This is my perspective. <laughs> I think it's I think it's a really interesting topic, and and the law is obviously evolving. We haven't had um, some decisions in cases in Australia about AI and how it how it interplays with uh, performance rights and moral rights. But I think there is a discussion about uh, ethics as well. Uh, well. Some of the lawsuits in the US involve, um, you know, you can chat into it, you can type into it uh, an image generator. I would like you to produce a piece of artwork in the style of a current artist. Um, and then you don't have to pay that artist to produce the artwork, but you will still get something that's in their style. 
Um, there's a question as to whether that would infringe the copyright of the artist in Australia, even if the um, uh, the artificial intelligence system was trained with the artwork of that particular artist. But I think as a as a, as a broader question, um, from an ethical standpoint, it's going to it's already very difficult as an artist or a musician or a creative to make any money. Um, so if people are going to be able to use these tools for these purposes, are those jobs going to disappear? Are we going to lose that creative content? I, I think is something that is causing people concern, at least in Australia. Yeah, yeah that, that a very uh, hot topic uh, to be, uh, that uh, had been discussed uh, among scholars. The, uh, for uh, the stand, from the standpoint of a copyright holder, uh, they will be harmed by the generative AI uh, because uh, they uh, learn uh, their uh, copyrighted works and they easily created uh, similar products. But uh, uh, from the legal standpoint, uh, it is obvious that the uh, style or a painting style uh, is not copyrightable. So uh, the, uh, most of the scholars uh, allege that uh, I understand uh, what the copyright holders uh, feel uh, about uh, that they are harmed, but uh, uh, regrettably, it is not a subject of uh, interest uh, to be protected by copyright law. So uh, the uh, hot debate is still continuing, but uh, I think uh, there will be necessary to have some special laws or some kind of uh, remuneration system to compromise uh, between the parties. Yeah, I think that was interesting. I think that the French discussion was talking about that possibly um, having some sort of system to compensate uh, the artists where the yes. material is being used in the training data. Um, apart from copyright, I think that an issue that people are concerned about in Australia the most is probably the use of personal information, and particularly the use of personal information in ways that you might not have expected um, and that you don't know about. And uh, this is probably the case because um, we're... I think Australians are a little bit scarred by a thing that we had in Australia called RoboDebt, where the Australian government... Uh, use people's personal data, particularly their tax information, to make some calculations and some automated decision making about whether they've been paid too much welfare. And so whether they were in debt to the government and had to pay back this welfare. But the problem was that it, it wasn't artificial intelligence, but it was automated decision making, which is what AI can be used for. Um, and so there was no manual oversight of these letters that were going out to numerous, numerous people who were already in very difficult circumstances saying, you owe sometimes tens of thousands of dollars to the government. Um, and it was later on determined that a lot of those letters were wrong. These people didn't actually owe a debt. Uh, but when these people called up the Australian government to say, well, how did you calculate the debt? They, they, they couldn't be told. It was, it was all done by the machine. There was no one there who could walk them through the calculation so that they could prove that it was wrong. And so we um it's the the scheme has recently been um held to be unlawful and we've had a royal commission into it. Um and uh the 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 government when they're considering these guide rails and things that we're going to put around AI, they want to cover off on also this use of personal information for automated decision making to make sure that those decisions that are being made are still going to be transparent and that they're not going to include bias and that people know when they're personal information is going to be used that way. Are, are there concerns about privacy in Japan? Is it a hot topic? Well, I should not say it is fortunate, but the, uh, the uh, digitalization of public service by government uh, has not so progressed nor improved in Japan yet. <laughs> So, <laughs> so, so it, it, yeah, it, it, it will cause uh, some kind of problems in the future. But uh, by now, uh, we are on the much uh, more uh, be, um, basic side. Uh, how to uh, establish, not improve, but has to establish the, and complete uh, the digitalization of our public service. <laughs> <laughs> So I see that um, we haven't had any questions except for one asking about slides. 
And mm. I think the plan was that the slides would be distributed. I know that we are uh, producing like a final recording, um, which will include these Q and A's, which um, will be distributed. Hopefully there will be slides as well, but feel free. I think the person who asked the question was anonymous. Feel free to um, email myself or to email Taketo and uh, and we can give you an, an answer to that offline. Um, and 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 thank you again for, for hanging around for the whole discussion. Um, the Ally Law Network has uh, lawyers in, in, in multiple countries around the world. So if you have specific questions that uh, relate to a particular jurisdiction, just hop onto the Ally Law uh, website and you'll find a member firm there who can help you. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you very much.